My name is Tom Questy, and I'm the head of digital sales here at LKCS. Today, I'm going to be talking about modern website design and deciding when it's the right time to start a website design project. So before we jump into it, for anyone here who might not be familiar with us, I'd just like to take a second to go over who we are here at LKCS. LKCS was founded on the core values of providing the best service, high quality, fast turnaround, and fair pricing. We continue to stand by these values today as we evolve our marketing, digital, print, mail, and statement services to fit the needs of our customers. So we're a full service marketing company, and we've been in business since 1961, and we've predominantly worked with financial institutions the entire time. Uh, we provide a full range of products and services, but today we're going to be focusing on website design. So, however, if there's anything else you're kind of wanting to learn more about, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. In this webinar, I'll be going over the basic questions that you need to ask yourself when thinking about building a new website and upgrading your overall digital presence. Our main topics are going to be reviewing your current website and identifying any problems, how you can meet today's standards in website design, how you can provide a premium user experience, and asking yourself if your current website is generating enough new leads and the ways that we can increase that. Then we'll also talk a little bit about what to do after identifying those problems with any of those topics. Usually the very first experience that your users will have with you will be online. So knowing this, the big questions are, are you using digital marketing effectively? And will your website win them over when they reach it? Also, once they're part of your organization, are you managing to keep them satisfied? If your digital marketing and your website aren't able to provide a good user experience, then you have a gigantic problem right off the bat. There are tons of other competitors that are willing to provide a strong suite of digital services. So whether it's another local institution or one of the big banking options that are available, you can't create bad first impressions that let your prospects slip away. People have gotten used to the ease and convenience that they can get from doing everything online. And that's no longer something to think about as a luxury, it's an expectation. So your website needs to fully facilitate that. Otherwise, the first impressions of your organization will be that it's subpar to these other options out there. This is one of the quickest way to scare away those new prospects. So how do you know when it's time to dive into a revamp of your website or your other digital services? Obviously, if the design is starting to look dated, there's a big sign right there, but looks can be kind of subjective. So it's good to ask more concrete questions. So let's start by asking if we're meeting today's standards. This is an easy place to start. If your website is not meeting the basic standards of the day, then you may be turning away all of those prospects immediately. And this is more than just asking if your site's well designed. You need to determine whether your site is built for mobile devices, for accessibility, and with a great user experience in mind. So I stress this in a similar uh, webinar that I gave last year, but I don't imagine it'll surprise anyone here that over half of worldwide website traffic is on mobile devices. So if you're still somehow convinced that the number of people browsing on mobile is small, hopefully this will be an overdue wake up call. Uh, I don't think there's many people in here that would disagree with that. Uh, but when I talk about signs that a redesign is needed, I like to include a big slide like this, just in case anyone is still firmly stuck in the past. Uh, most likely over half of your users are browsing on some form of mobile device when they connect to your site. And if your website's unintuitive to browse on a phone or a tablet, then you have huge issues. 
being responsive to mobile devices isn't just a convenience. This is something that users fully expect as well. And if your website isn't built to adapt to any screen size, then that's just a giant red flag. So let's go over some simple questions to identify mobile problems. Do users have to side scroll when they're browsing your, your site? Uh, so when you're viewing it on a smaller device, does it force you to, your users to scroll side to side to see the full width of the page? We don't run into a whole lot of pages that still have side scroll issues. Nowadays, um, they, they're still around, but it's a giant red flag if it does. The more common thing we do run into is a lot of pages that either format weirdly when sized down, so having the layout stack in a very odd way, or specific tools like calculators or rates tables that just become a mess at smaller sizes. Be sure to review for that. Are some of the elements of the site illegible at smaller screen sizes? So when you size down, do elements or the text size reach that kind of illegible point? Uh, for example, we see homepage banners often where um, that's something I would pay close attention to. In aging sites, you can see the text on those banners on a mobile device, often the image sizes down so much that it becomes extremely difficult to read. Um, with our sites, uh, with our sites in particular, we usually set up, uh, it basically, we set it up to substitute images that include text uh, with custom mobile layout versions to avoid this. Uh, the images substitute at certain breakpoints for those screen sizes. So we do that with a lot of those big banner images and things like that. And that's just one way that we help to alleviate some of those mobile problems. The last thing would be, do the pages actually lose their intended function? So is the functionality of your pages ruined when a user views them on a smaller device? And does that interfere with the main goals of the pages in question? And also beyond just like page layout, does your navigation itself still function in a streamlined way when it's brought down to that size? So during your review of, this, of your current site, if most of these questions highlight issues, then there's some very clear problems with your design when it comes to mobile devices. So let's move beyond the bare minimum of having your site be responsive to all devices. Next, I wanna focus on design and some of the trends that our designers have been seeing in website design. So behavioral design is something we've been seeing get leveraged more often in our day-to-day -day lives. This is a tactic that is usually used more in apps. It's um, something that's used to reward or nudge a user to kind of take action. For example, um, an exercise app might remind a user to get up and move at certain times of the day or award badges based on accomplishments or milestones that they reach. This kind of design can be a little harder to achieve directly in a website but with tools like tracking and automation, and when you pair it up to like something like email marketing, there would be definitely room to create, create and trigger um, very complex or creative campaigns that could pursue this kind of idea. Micro interactions have been a big part of good user experience for a while now, but there's no sign of that slowing down. Tools and experiences can be added to websites to make them feel more interactive, which helps to keep the user's attention. In financial websites, we see these kind of interactions in the tools that they provide. So tools like interactive rate comparisons, calculators, and even having like guided experiences that welcome new prospects to the site. These can all be effective at holding attention but also at navigating users through financial information that could be seen as complex. In the same vein as micro interactions, using motion and animation across the website is vital by today's design standards. This doesn't have to be complex parallax animations, but rather having visual cues on important elements like call to action buttons and icons 
is an expectation of the average user. Uh, and this could qualify in that micro interaction category since it helps to keep focus and it also projects that an element is interactive. But I wanted to separate motion out as its own bullet point here this year just to highlight how expected it is. Not meeting the bar on interactivity is a big sign of an aging website. Style-wise, we're also seeing a lot of nostalgia kind of creep into today's designs. This isn't necessarily getting directed to one specific time period in particular. However, we're seeing a focus on bringing back styles that would be considered more loud or maybe playful than a lot of modern website design does. Um, this can be seen prominently in typeface choices, and it's not uncommon to see more stylized serif or decorative fonts, getting used to call out important areas of a site, and then to pair that with the more modern minimalist, min, uh, sorry, minimalist sections alongside them, kind of what we're used to right now. And this contrast gets used to help sort content, but also is great for drawing more attention to those stylized areas. Used correctly, this can be very eye-catching uh, and a great way to highlight important pieces of your layout. I'll add that some of this more stylized design is something we're seeing kind of outside of the financial institution sites currently. However, if your brand is capable of taking advantage of a more exploratory uh, design choice, it can really help you stand out from the crowd around you. And then artificial intelligence is probably the most hot button topic that we've been seeing. Um, I think we're still in the early stages of its implementation, but we're already seeing it get baked into many of the digital tools that are getting used on websites. I think the most common uses we're seeing in our field right now are centered around content generation. So as the technology gets more sophisticated, it has the potential to alleviate the more tedious parts of website management. Right now, I still think anything generated with AI needs manual review to kind of account for its accuracy, but advances are getting made every day. The next big question is to ask, is your website built for accessibility? Accessibility is an always growing topic in the digital space. For example, it wasn't too long ago that the WCAG guidelines were updated to version 2.2. And as those accessibility benchmarks grow and evolve, your site needs to grow with them. This is a subject that we're asked about often and are able to provide a lot of solutions for. Um, I think the first question we usually get is just, where do I start? So there are many different solutions out there that can help with accessibility. From our experience though, you usually wanna start by completely scanning your site and have professionals fix the errors that are found. So if your site was not originally built with accessibility in mind, this can result in some big sweeping changes, which is why we often see older sites opt to do a full redesign during that process. Accessibility also takes ongoing vigilance and maintenance. So as you make changes to the site, it's common to have some slip ups that might break from the accessibility guidelines. And this is why we recommend having your site routinely scanned for errors and have ex expert, sorry, experts to execute any changes that are needed. There are also plugins available that can provide a safety net by making live changes while a user is browsing the site. And these can be a great as an extra layer of protection but it's still smart to find these errors and permanently correct them in the code. If you feel you need any advice on any of these accessibility options, please feel free to reach out. We have solutions available and can advise on how to cover yourself and how to maintain accessibility through a site's lifetime. And you may be asking if the whole website needs to get redesigned for these topics. And when it comes to a large amounts of accessibility issues or lack of mobile responsiveness, I would usually say yes. Some of the questions we get often are like, couldn't the programming just be tweaked to make my existing website passable? 
And yes, you could do that, but I wouldn't really recommend it. If your site was designed without mobile responsive capabilities or without ADA in mind, then the chances are high that no thought of these things actually factored into the overall design or layout when it was built way back when. And beyond just being responsive to the screen size, it's important to design modern sites with mobile in mind throughout that entire process. Our design process here takes a mobile first approach when tackling the goals of any new website design. And this makes for a better experience overall. It helps to create a site that responds to any situation in an understandable and elegant way. It also creates an experience that can be navigated by anyone on any platform. And this is why it's so important for, to design for both desktop and mobile devices simultaneously. Why it's so important to design with accessibility in mind through the whole process. A modern website needs to operate seamlessly no matter what the device is and no matter who the user is. It also helps to guarantee success when all of this is planned ahead at a foundational level. So after you have some of those like bare bones basics, the next thing to start getting into is are you providing a premium user experience? Uh, so this is another great question to reflect on when reviewing your current digital tools, your ability to get web visitors to convert. This topic should be looked at from a pretty wide perspective. Uh, from the first time a prospect hears about you to the very end goals you have for those users. So whether that's someone discovering you, opening an account, filling out a form, or just easily using your services, user experience needs to be a primary goal of your web development team. Today's average users want to be able to complete as much as possible without having to step into a branch. Um, and in a lot of meetings, one of the most common goals I hear about redesigns is that institutions want to appeal to younger demographics to get uh, new customers or members, but also have a balance that they have to balance that with still appealing to their older account holders. Um, and it often comes up as if these two types of users want completely or wildly different things. But I have good news for anyone that's currently thinking that way. This is an area where those two groups often agree. The majority of users want to be able to complete their tasks online without any hassle. So simplicity and efficiency are gonna be beneficial for everyone. It's also worth noting that this isn't something that's just beneficial to the users. Institutions that commit to digital banking and restructuring will often spend less money on in their product delivery and operating cost. So it's important to review your services and identify if there's any gaps in your process where you don't uh, give a user a way to act on it digitally. For example, if someone lands on your homepage already wanting to start a mortgage, navigating through that goal should be effortless on their end. It should have minimal steps that they can take digitally as they go through the process. So, how do we make that happen? Start by looking at your digital marketing and how you're driving traffic to your site. Are you reaching the, the people that you need to? Are they taking action once they get there? And are we able to track users through that process and gain more data that we can leverage later on? Your website will serve as your virtual branch that users can access at any time to research your services, ask questions, establish and expand banking relationships, and access their accounts. So if you're not meeting these needs, then that translates directly into less opportunity for you to get the things that you want. Whenever it's possible, it's very important to remove barriers to entry for your users. The easier it is for them to quickly accomplish their goal on the site, the more likely they are to take that decisive action. So it's all about simplicity, which ironically can be the hardest to achieve in some of these designs. On any given page of your site, think about what the user's needs are 
then go through and think about the avenues you're currently giving them to accomplish those needs. Are the call to actions obvious and useful, or is there no clear way forward? If you don't present your users with intuitive ways to move forward, then chances are they just won't. Is the layout of the page's content easily digestible, or is it dull and confusing? Your users deserve content that's worth their time, so keep it simple and on task. And we know making great content can be difficult, but it drastically alters and affects the user experience. So when planning for a new website, the first step for content is to review whether everything across your current site is up to date. And then I would start dialing in to where the content could be more expressive or interactive. Ask yourself questions like, could anything be substituted or supported with something like a video? Um, are there any tools or resources that we could be providing on this specific page? Um, and then while browsing the content, are the call to actions always available to take that next step? When planning for the new site, be sure to review all the pages across your current site and do this with the full intention of not only editing, but eliminating pages that no longer matter or could be condensed into one page instead of several. I usually try to, I, I like to refer to this as content bloat. As a website ages, usually a lot of pages or excess content can get added over its lifetime. So pruning this back will be great for simplifying the navigation and the structure of that new site. And this lets your users get to the content that they're seeking out faster. The content of your site should be kind of looked at as a journey for your users. The journey starts with their goal. So this could be something like opening an account or applying for a loan. In that case, we can look at filling out one of our applications as the finish line of this journey. Um, and that journey along the way should guide them towards that finish line at every step. So our goal with the content is to always provide quality and to always have a way to take action or guide them to the next step. On the subject of quality content, personalization, is, that's gonna be a topic I'll be touching on a little bit later, can be used, this is something that can use tracking and then the data gained from tracking to identify types of users and present them with content that will probably be more beneficial for them. So this creates a much better user experience with content that's tailored to each person. So if our collective data identifies someone as being interested in a certain product, we can tailor their experience from start to finish to be different from our standard content. Which kind of leads to my next point. If we're not offering quality content and instead I'm getting confused, uh, and this can have, even if you're offering the best content ever, there's always a chance for a user to get confused along the way. But you need to ask yourself, is there an obvious way that I can reach out for help? Or do they have to search around for a way to contact you? Don't make getting into con in contact with you difficult for your users. If you can, provide some different avenues that they can reach you by. Chat systems are an option we're seeing get kind of often overlooked or maybe more accurately, we see institutions are worried that they might not have the manpower to directly field questions through a chat. And if that sounds familiar, I feel like a chat bot could be a great option to look into. Chat bots have improved vastly over the last few years and can be a great resource to field questions and assist users in your off hours. Your website should always make it simple to get help when it's needed especially when reaching out for help is usually a great way to secure information or even more like useful data from that user. So it's kind of a twofold benefit to you to make reaching out easy. Identifying users is such an important step when delving deeper into analytics and into automation. So if you've gotten this far into the topic of reviewing your site and your digital services, this is also a great time to review any third-party services you might be using. I think sometimes we fall into the mistake of thinking that it's not 
if it's not something that we directly control, then it doesn't reflect poorly on our site. But that's just categorically not true. Go through your site and find the places that you lead someone to a calculator or to an application that runs through a third party. Um, go through those and pretend you're filling it out and judge that experience for yourself. Anything that you have built into your site or recommend to your users is going to be part of your site and your brand in their eyes. You should be just as critical and thoughtful about what third-party resources you use as you are with anything that you control. If the external digital services that you use aren't up to par, there's plenty of options available. LKCS has many custom tools that available that we've built. Um, and if there's something that we don't currently offer, then we're more than happy to give you advice and point you in what we think is the right direction for what you're looking for. I know one pro of the problems that we see that's pretty common today is that over time, an institution will be using more and more third-party tools that on their own might be very useful. However, often they don't integrate or work well with each other. Um, and this can cause big problems with your internal workflow. Um, I like to kind of compare it to the tangle of wires that can kind of build up either behind your TV or behind a computer. And as you add more accessories and keep piling it on, it just becomes a mess back there that gets harder and harder to untangle if you ever have to move things around. So don't let it reach that point of critical mass. Like I mentioned before, we're well versed in different third party software options, and we have suggestions to help make sure in the future the tools that you're using will integrate as much as possible. It's often one of the main things that we discuss in strategy meetings that kind of future proofing. So don't let outdated services you've been settling for drag your site's user experience down. Next, we'll talk a little bit about generating new leads. So how is your site generating interest in your products and services and then converting that interest into either new members or new accounts? If you can't answer that question, then it's time to talk about it. The most successful websites guide prospects with personalized content, like I mentioned before, and drive them to provide those contact details or provide that lead. And this is what I was mentioning a bit earlier. It, it can be achieved through things like gated content, email subscriptions, calculators, web forms. There's so many points of entry that you could have. Um, ideally, at that point, we would start doing automated follow-up and continue providing relevant information to these prospects. And the goal there is to result in higher conversion rates. So usually when you're starting to do something like this, you'll begin by outlining your goals and starting to collect data. Ideally, you'll set up goals for your digital services and the ways to track those results. Data is going to be needed if you're going to go into personalization and automation. And these are two processes that can be such a big factor when it comes to lead generation. Like I mentioned earlier, personalization can be used throughout your digital marketing to more accurately focus your efforts. And when used correctly, it can be an effective way to create campaigns or moments throughout uh, the browsing that are more relevant to each specific user. It can be used for simple things like using the first name in an email to make it more personal, or it can be used for more complex experiences like providing variable content on pages of your site. The goal here is not just to provide more content, but to make sure that the content across the site is of a higher quality for each user. So for example, if you're tracking the behavior of certain users, you might gain insights into what products that they're interested in. With this information, you could format specific elements of the page to swap out or change to reflect that interest. So if we identified a specific user that was interested in an auto loan, we could reflect this in places like the banner ads on the homepage, quick links across our inside pages, or even testimonials that show up for them as they browse the site. This would give them more chances to take action or even automatically offer them a promotion to get them to that next step. 
It should also be mentioned that this doesn't always have to be used to promote and sell products. It can also be used to inform your users and offer tools that are specific to their needs. So while looking into a redesign for your site, it's much easier to bake personalization into that process. That way you can kind of start planning ahead and brainstorming the different ways that you can utilize this technology to benefit both you and your audience. Using data to provide the right content at the right time will create a better experience for anyone browsing the site. You can then use that to nurture leads and build revenue with a marketing automation platform that makes you work smarter, not harder. Um, automation takes your marketing to another level. With it, you can use the data that you've been collecting to take users down certain marketing tracks. These preset tracks can be created to consistently present the right offers to people based on their previous behaviors. And this is because automation is pretty much always combined with personalization. Obviously, one of the best things about automation is that it takes a bit of pressure off of your marketing team. The idea of fully automating your marketing efforts isn't really quite the result. So sorry to any marketers that are picturing your, might be picturing themselves kind of kicking back with their feet up on the desk. Uh, but after setting it up, it frees up more of your time to do less of the busy work that comes with running these campaigns. Automation takes a lot of thought and groundwork to get set up, but after that's done, it can start humming along on its own in the background and then let you be on top of it as it goes. So reviewing data and statistics and then improving and refining the tracks that it's taking your users down. It lets you edit those touch points to kind of perfect them. With some time, you'll have created elegant solutions to many of your marketing needs that will do a lot of the footwork on its own. From there on out, it's all about supervising to make sure that your system stays updated and improves over time. Like personalization, the sky's the limit with how creative you can get with automations. Um, using data you've gathered from your users, you can do some incredibly focused marketing. And when done subtly and correctly, this will be an extremely effective tool for lead generation. Uh, LKCS has several solutions and suggestions to get you started with personalization and automation. Um, planning a new website with the intention of incorporating these in can put you in a great place for future growth of your digital services. Uh, we don't have the time available in this webinar to really do a deep dive into them right now. However, if you're interested in learning more about personalization or automation, we actually have a previous webinar I gave earlier this year about both those topics uh, available on our YouTube channel. Or if you're ready to just start a conversation about it, please reach out to us so we can set up a demo. So after doing all that reviewing and kind of planning those your wants and needs, what are the next steps? So you'll find out that it's time to just start planning for those updates. Uh, the good news is that throughout this webinar, we've already identified some of the main issues of your current digital services. But what we, we've been going through here are just some of the bigger red flags. Before jumping straight into a new project, it's important to do a little bit of research and make decisions about your new direction. Uh, looking at what your competitors are offering, whether local or national, you can start to identify features and digital tools that you need to be competing with. It's smart to be aware of what kind of services are being offered around you. And even if some of them aren't items that you can act on immediately, you can at least build with these future goals in mind. And that's something we often see with uh, those bigger items like automation and personalization is a lot of times you might not be ready to jump into that right off the bat, but as long as you're building the site with that in mind, you're going to be in a good place. Spend some time reflecting on what separates you from the competitors around you and what you can offer that they don't. What makes you unique to your audience or how can you represent the ideals of your institution throughout your user experience? 
find some websites that you like, and as you're browsing the web, keep tabs on the websites that you personally enjoy. Identify what it is about these sites that made your experience on it better. And when you're researching like this, don't feel like you have to restrict yourself to your specific industry. For instance, if you're a financial institution, don't feel like you can only draw inspiration from a bank or a credit union website. Like we've talked about before, this can be useful when comparing digital services and tools, but design inspiration can be drawn from anywhere. Doing this research and writing notes will give your designers kind of a mood board of the styles, the tools, the features, that big wish list that you want to see incorporated in the new build. So after you end up building or going through a redesign uh, or a full revamp of your digital services, something to keep in mind is don't let this happen again, uh, or at least do your best to keep everything relevant longer. That's always the goal. I know that probably sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised at how far a bit of organization and maintenance goes. Always be on the lookout for the things that I've talked about in this webinar. Keep making goals, take time to identify the issues, and then take strides to improve the overall experience. Eventually, every project goes out of date, but there are plenty of ways to keep things fresh, and these shouldn't just be something you set up and forget. Yes, digital services are an avenue to automation and can be less hands-on, but I would heavily argue with anybody who's trying to take a complete hands-off approach. Even automated campaigns take careful curation at the start and continue tweak, continued tweaking to get the best results. Ignoring maintenance and updates can cause your site to age faster and put you back in the situation that caused the rework in the first place. So keep active and keep improving. For example, here's one thing that we do with our websites. Uh, for all our, our clients, we send out an annual care report um, in this report, we review the site and we point out anything that we see as troubling or outdated. Uh, and this is a way of helping our clients keep up with this task. Uh, it, we know it's not always easy to stay vigilant about your own site. And web trends and best practices are always changing and they always will be. So we like to assist our clients with advice on maintaining a modern web presence. And that covers everything that I wanted to discuss when planning for a new website and thinking about your digital branch. I hope this helps if you were interested in updating and learning what should be critical about what you should be critical about when reviewing your, your current digital services. Um, I hope that after this, you feel like you have a bit more understanding on website redesign and some of the topics that come with it. As always, we here at LKCS are ready to help you with any new projects you may have in mind. So please get in contact with me or any of our sales reps to get started. Uh, again, I'm Tom Quessy, head of digital sales here at LKCS. If anyone has any questions, I'm gonna stay on the line for the next few minutes uh, to answer anything that comes through the chat. So thank you so much for attending this webinar and we hope to see you at the next one.